Hello and welcome to an order of drive through records with no money in the bank, which is as usual myself, Tom B, and uh, me, Andrew Marsh. Hiya. What? Hiya. One day we don't get that seamless, but I think it's going to be when we're actually in the same room as yeah. each other. And that's the only way we can justify this. Too sweet, me. Um, too sweet, too, too sweet, yep. Too sweet, me. Too yeah. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> this is the show where we go through every single release that Drive Through Records has released. It's in the name release, isn't it? And we say what we think about it. Drive Through Records is one of our favorite record labels. There's a lot of nostalgia attached to it. It's all going to be gold, right? It's all gold. One would think. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Today we are going to be talking about. RX Bandits, uh, those damn bandits, or as they were known then, oh, the pharmaceutical, was it pharmaceutical bandits or the pharmaceutical bandits? I'm not sure, to be mm. honest. Well, we can find that out, yeah. The pharmaceutical bandits, which bandits. is a much worse name than RX Bandits, but I, it's not worth changing your name over. No, it's a bit lengthy. Um, I, I know, but I mean, if you can get shit band like, names like right... we were just saying. Yeah, if you know shit band names like Real Big Fish, I don't see why you can't have the pharmaceutical bandits. Yeah, that's mm. my that's my argument. That's always my argument. Real Big Fish have a terrible name, so therefore everyone should feel all okay about their terrible names. It sounds like uh, it sounds like the name of a documentary for, for that. Um, what's he called? Oh. The kid that bought like those anti those cancer drugs and then tried to shitload of money for them. Martin Watts' his face, big farmer man. Uh, he is Martin a farmer. No. Skrill. Martin Skrill. Yeah, sounds like Skrill. That's all I kind of remember. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, he is he, a pharmaceutical bandit. Maybe he's an actual pharmaceutical he's bandit. He's an actual pharmaceutical bandit, but he doesn't do um, he doesn't do Star as far as I'm aware. Let, no. let, maybe that's what he started doing in prison. I started started a little prison prison uh, star band. Maybe he did. He did like um. He did kind of start a record label, you know. Did, wasn't he the person who bought the Wu Tang Clan album, which was like only yeah. one person could buy it and only one person could listen to it for ages. That's and it was right, this whole yeah. big thing, and then he's the person who bought it, and the internet was just like couldn't have gone to anyone worse. Yeah. <laughs> it's like this is the worst case scenario of what could have happened. Yeah, he signed that band to the hotel hotelier. Oh yeah. Which incidentally, I am wearing the t-shirt right now. Oh, so in a in a pharmaceutical bandit theme. Mm-hmm. Because I'm I'm not condoning what he did by wearing this t-shirt. I just like to make that clear. <laughs> you just like the hotelier. Yes. Yeah, it's bad. Um, I was very excited for this episode because uh, this is 1997, September 1st. Um, which catalogue number is it? Because it's their third release, but I think there's compilations in between. I think this might be catalogue number five. Yeah, I think it is. Because there's a Christmas compilation of all fucking things. And I was excited about this because RX Bandits are, and I'm very vocal about this, one of my favourite bands. But in the same way that The Wonder Years are one of my favourite bands, I've somehow managed to go my entire life without listening to their first ever album. Or at least yeah. not or at least not properly. It's like RS Bandits, as far as I'm concerned, their first album is halfway between here and there. And yeah. then Progress is the soft is the sophomore Barnstormer album. Yeah. I did I didn't realise that they'd even had a name change at any point. The first time I had to listen to this, I was like, I didn't know it was the same band. No, I get that. But it, and it's and that's the weird thing about the album overall. It gone straight into this. Um RS Bandits, in my opinion, are the masters of reinventing their sound. Like they're yes. the ones who like with every album there's an there's an evolution there and there's something that makes it a bit different and not just star or not just pop punk. It's I think mm -hmm. when I first discovered them in uni, I kinda like described them as the prod rock of star, which sounds awful, but to me is fan, is a fantastic album. Yeah, no, I get that. I think when you change your sound like that so often, you do kind of risk alienating some of your fans who kind of got into you when you were more of a 
conventional ska band. I get that, but there's still always been a consistency with them. Yeah, and by the same token, as a band, you know, you, you must be, you, you don't want to be writing the same thing every time. No. So. It's like you can't win or lose situation. It's like it, it's like with Blink, right, when the self-title came out. Like, mm. there were a bunch of, like, old school fans who just wanted more, who just wanted more of Dude Ranch and Cheshire Cat. Whereas you can't deny that the self-titled album is one of their best albums, despite the fact that it sounds completely different to a lot of what they've done before. Yeah, yeah, it really grew on me. Really. Yeah, no, I hate it. I hate it when it first came out. Um, this album, like, Those Damn Bandits, is an odd one because there's certain tracks where you can hear the RS Bandits in it. It's like you listen to it and you go, this is an RS Bandits track. But then there's, like, this weird other half of the album, which could very easily just be like some of their mates. Yes. Yeah. Like, it's almost like it's two, there's not a consistency, but there's two sets of consistency. And mm. with like Modern Ears, I guess, this actually sounds like a very generic run-of-the-mill Star album. But yeah. 1997, especially compared to the last two Star-influenced albums and like one of them, an all-out Star album of Drive Through, this is the best thing Drive Through have released so far in terms of actual music or capability. And so yeah. it sounded a bit different. This sounds like no other star from 97 to me. No. My kind of first introduction to this band was on kind of, there was a Drive Through Records DVD came came out. Oh, yeah. Uh, and a lot of it was live performances. Um, and there was a lot of, you know, bands doing kind of pop punk. And then you had the RX Bandits who were doing something very different in the fact they were doing ska, but also just their kind of competency and their capability for playing music was a hell of a lot more advanced than a lot of the bands on the label at the time. I think that's the thing as well, because like, even if you even if you like start going up later, so like you go back to like two thousand one when you've got like New Found Glory and all the like drive through mainstays releasing stuff out. Same year Progress came out. Progress is still one of the most musically capable albums on the entire label. They were singing about the war in Rwanda and stuff like that. Yeah. They were fucking singing about, you know, girls not dating them and that kind of thing. Which is what is so surprising about this album, because um, we'll get into some of the shittier stuff on it later, but a lot of this album is just, girls won't date me, why won't girls date me? I'm so nice. My yeah. mates play trumpet. Why won't? No, what's wrong? <laughs> it's like, mm. and it was kind of upsetting, like, because I kind of always wanted to believe that Irish Bandits were that forward-thinking, thoughtful band straight out the can. But it turns out they also had their dickhead stage. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But this is still head and shoulders above. It, m- musically, it's like solely on a musical thing. This is head and shoulders above anything else that's come out so far. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, there's, there's not much competition. You've got that decent Phoenix TX album and then that fucking Cousin Oliver record. Yeah. But True. Of the, you know, of the three, I think you're right. And there's also, like, even, even this early on, you can hear, like, you can hear parts of the bands that they went on to influence because I've always said I don't if we didn't have RS Bandits I don't think we'd have got like Cap Down I, I think RS Bandits sound like a British star band or a British star punk band in that experimentation yeah. <clears throat> and I don't think that I don't think that we'd have like JB Conspiracy or Cap Down or The Adequate Seven which aren't big bands but they are in my opinion influential bands yeah and I think a lot of that is down to RS in fact, I'm pretty sure most of those bands have supported RX at some point. Yeah, I'm sure they are. Yeah, they, they were the ska band's favourite ska band that this, you know. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, I and my second track on it, which we're not going to talk about much, but I Will Live, sounds like a, mo- sounds like a modern ska punk song. It's like, it's got bits of like, you said JB Conspiracy's Died in Lights, for example, which is, came out this year, and you can hear that in it. And I yeah. do think that's impressive and a great legacy. But now that I'm done waxing lyrical, we do have to move on to the thing that we said we talked about with this album. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Which is sadly, sadly becoming a theme of the show as, as it stands. Well, we've always joked that this, we've always joked that pop, punk, and star are problematic genres. Yeah. It's almost that, like, I understand you, no one else understands you, because 
pop punk and ska artists and singers, certainly in the 90s and early 2000s, are big kids. Yes. I mean, I mean, for all intents, they were kids. I'm, I'm sure they were probably like 19 when they wrote this. True. That is, that is true. I mean, considering that drive through was basically a young duck star label, it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, they had a fucking starting line and he was only 16. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what we said we're going to do in the show from now on is we've realized that we're going on for like over an hour and a half because we're just trying to break down everything. Uh, so between us, we've chosen three tracks and we're going to focus on those tracks and we'll just talk about the album overall in the context of that. Because one thing I will say about this is it's got its standout tracks, both for better and for worse. But the rest of it does kind of just bleed into each other very easily. It's good, but it's like, it's still quite generic sounding, so you can get away with it. Um, which of the three would you like to talk about first, Andrew? I've got track number one, Teen Idol, track number three, Milk, or the penultimate track, although I barely want to call it that, and I'm going to get into this in a bit, um, track 11, I Don't Care. Yeah, and um, well, so I guess probably the easiest way to do it is to go chronologically. Yeah. Which means we start with the song Teen Idol. Um, which has the lyric, are you ready for some football? So therefore you would have to say it's the best way to kick off an album, Tom. <laughs> I actually believe that this is the um, Conservative Party's new stance on COVID. Just like, doesn't matter, are you ready for some football? Let's play <laughs> some football. <laughs> yeah. This Boris Johnson skank into the podium. <laughs> Thing, cynical attempt to get people to stop thinking about their many flaws. <laughs> back. I think I think the thing that this works this works as an opening track. This is like musically, this is a fucking solid opening track because it is. I, I think I've, the two words I've got written down first in this notebook are just obnoxiously star. Yes, it's like like so. but this does what every first track should do, and it just you go straight in. And you're just like, right, I know what this, I know what this is. In that first 30 seconds, which we'll yeah. play underneath here, because we are going to start doing that. In that first 30 seconds, you get like that really just kind of that pick it up, blah, 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 like the noises, the upstrokes, like all of it. The upstrokes being a yeah. uh, stroke, a star strokes cover band. Everyone knows that. <laughs> the, uh, the first track on an album should be kind of like a mission statement for that album exactly like uh, i always reference this as one of the best first first tracks but um suburbia of new all or oh, that's not what it's called you know what i mean but wonder years came out swinging exactly it's just that yeah. it's just that first like minute where you're just like this is what the album is mm -hmm. like if you're not on board with this you are not going to enjoy the album yeah which I is necessary. I mean, especially if especially when you got like cassettes and vinyl. Like, this is before you could skip tracks. Yeah, I can't imagine listening to music without being able to skip the shit once. But what, um, what were your thoughts on this one then? Because I mean, I think it's a strong open track. Yeah, it's all right. Um, in terms of lyric, in terms of a lyric, um, you're a slut, and that's what I like about you. Oh yeah, I think I've written it down as uh, you're a slut and I think that's cool. And it's not alright, is it? <laughs> yes, yeah, so you've taken the second bit and I've wrote the first bit. Because that, That's just how in sync we are. We just like that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, not bad in sync, not both my Andrew and broke the laptop. So, <laughs> oh, no. it's like, I just kind of want to know like, who this Megan is. Like, what she does, it, it's like a love song, but it's that typical pop punk star love song of just like, this is why I like you, because of all the things that everyone's going to say about you, because you're a swag. And it's not yeah. nice, it's not all right. I don't, I, but it was so normal then. Yeah. And it shouldn't be. I don't understand how it was ever okay. I wonder how Megan herself felt about being, um, memorialized in this song that's I, I this is the example i always use but i always think that about anyone that like really 
nasty like songs like this that become popular are written about like i don't know like uh, should we go down swinging i'm just a notch in your bedpost but you're just a line in the song i don't know who that's about but it can't feel nice to every time every time you turn on um Karang, you've got patrick stump just going mm, pretty much directly at you yeah yeah i do wonder i, I assume that the name's been changed you know if, if you're writing a song i assume you change the name of who you're writing about for the most part it's just weird i mean like songs about unrequited love are often creepy like there's no real way to do it in a way that isn't creepy because you are basically just kind of saying i've been watching you from a distance but yeah it i've never like busted what i go to school for that's it's creepy but no one reverts to name calling this is this is basically the theme of me yeah. of, like, of me of me reviewing these things it's just like look you be be creepy it's not okay but it's more acceptable than being a nasty prick what I go to school for was about a teacher, you know. That's relatable. Everyone fancied a teacher at some point. <laughs> but it's like it's it's a theme throughout this album and it's a bit of a shame really, but musically it's top notch. It like it sounds like a great track. And I have this thing when I listen to Scar where if there is a decent if there's a decent horn line or if there's decent riffs, I guess it was some pop punk as well. I zone out on the lyrics. Yeah. So it was only actually on the second listen that I did on this album because you texted me about the lyrics that I like zoned in and was just like, oh. Yeah. And, it, and it's like, if you're like, like we said, your first, your first track should be a mission statement. So do you really want, you're a slut, and I think that's okay as your mission statement. Probably not. <laughs> you any additional thoughts on it? No, that that covers it really. Like like you said, it's it's a good song to start an album with in terms of what's to come with the album. But yeah, it's just a couple of the lyrics are a bit disappointing. You know. Yeah, and again, and it's like that throughout the album, really. Um, we said we were skipping it, but I will say that I think "I Will Live" is actually a, is, musically speaking, is a better would have been a better opening track. Yeah, and it's as a track, it sounds more modern as well. Like that's got kind of like sax and trumpet lines in it, where a bit like, oh, oh this is going to be made now. I'm quite excited by this track. Yeah. Can we, um, just before we go into the second song we're going to talk about, can we, did you get a chance to see the album cover? Have you seen the album cover? <laughs> yeah, it looks terrible. What the hell is going on with that? <laughs> Jesus. Christ. It's like a manga kind of theme. Would, you, would that be fair to describe it? I see it as a bit of a mix between various different animes. So like, there's a little white, you've got your Dragon Ball Z, hair in the guitar yeah. Yeah. uh you've got one piece where maybe your guitarist is your bassist yeah uh your trombonist could also be one piece i don't know what the fucking panda is but it basically looks like they were just like every member of the band was just like who's your favorite anime character cool yeah that's who you're gonna be on this album <laughs> and then you've got this fellow at the top who's kind of coming into shot from above yeah you can like you know like a hat that Raiden wore from Mortal Kombat. It looks like something we draw, actually. Yeah. And also, I've got real issues with the font choice on the album title. Like just the vertical going down here where yeah. those damn bandits. It like it looks awful. Like there's things that are wider and narrower. It's but. It also, and I think this is something that kind of like really was a thing with Drive Through. It looks like a DIY album. Yeah. So it's got Drive Through behind it, and it's gonna get that push. But this is when Drive Through was brand new, and like when you're a brand new label, you do you push that DIY ethic more and more because people are just like, oh, let's check out the upstart. When you listen to like the LA Star stuff, nobody wants massively overproduced. Like, no. like Real Big Fish had that covered for everybody. Everybody wanted the underground stuff, which was commercialized. And you look at this album cover and you think it looks shit, but because it looks shit, it might be fun. Yeah. It's, it's like if someone 
who's really good at drawing manga just kind of sneezed and like everything in their brain came out of the nose onto an album cover. I feel like the album cover might have been someone's GCSE art coursework. Yeah. <laughs> like, that, you, like, you know that like that one 16 year old in every GCSE art class, you're just like, I'm really good at drawing manga and that's it. So that's all I'm going to do for all my coursework. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Check it out. It's a, it's a close up of a manga eye. Here is my manga hand. Seen a manga <laughs> toe? You have now. GCSE. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's kind of uh, quaint. It's quite, it's quite cute. It's yeah. got the most going on of album covers so far. Because the Phoenix, oh, yeah. like, uh, the River Phoenix was just their name. That's it. And it bold, striking, and kind of like, you look at it and you got to pick it up because you're just like, there's nothing on it, so it draws you to it. And the Cousin Oliver one is a similar situation. It's just their logo. So this is like the first album cover they've done where there's a foot ton going on. And the shit as it looks, it would stand out. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of weird for the sake of being weird. Yeah, it reminds me of when we did Valhara Decadence in Edinburgh and we just printed out some black and white A4 flyers I'd whipped up fucking shit faced at three in the morning. Yeah. And handed those and we were just like, and part of the appeal became like, look, it looks shit. And that's because it's held together with like blue tack and our own like hope. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Turns out, though, all you need is a sketch group to come to your comedy night, and then you've basically filled the audience. <laughs> hey, there were people there who weren't part of that sketch group or acts. Not many, but... Yeah. yeah. We did okay. It's the one thing we made profit on this Edinburgh. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Depressing. And so, track three, which mm-hmm. is Milk. I haven't listened to the lyrics properly yet for Milk, but so it might it might be a, it might be a garbage track for garbage people, but mm. I really like it. Like what I've listened to and how I have, it feels like musically it feels like a prototype for what they would later do in progress. This feels like an RX Bandits track, and this feels like how I know the RX Bandits. And I think you're about to tell me that the lyrics. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm, I'm, from, <laughs> from lyrically, um, it seems to be a song about not having any milk. That's what I thought as well. But because so much of the album is about like women dating and all that, I was just like, oh, I've probably just, I probably just zoned out and missed a misogynistic line or something. But like one of my notes is just kind of like it just says one of my favorite types of tracks like in pop punk and in star is when they're just about. Nothing important at all. <laughs> yeah. Unless it's like a metaphor of a euphemism or something, but I don't, I don't think it is. I think it's literally no. just a song about milk. Yeah, we, just, we don't have any milk. Fill the fridge, lads. Yeah. <laughs> but, and also, the sax solo in this track's amazing. The sax solo. Yeah, the sax solo is particularly good in this. It's very, it's very cat down. Well, I yeah. mean, cat down oh, is very yeah, I, know. I know what you mean. It's kind of like, you know, Blink it's really related to like suburban pop punk kids. Yeah. Because it was just kind of relatable about coming home from school and girls and stuff. Yeah, it's like, I've come home from school. I might have kissed a girl today. I don't know. Shall we get burritos? Fucking dogs. <laughs> well, <laughs> that, that, what you just said there is the whole of Dude Ranch. But, um. <laughs> You know, everyone can relate to wanting some milk and not having any, unless you I don't do. like milk. I, that's, I don't. I don't drink milk, Andrew. You know that. <laughs> so, and I, I don't drink it either. It's like, oh, no. I yeah, I would listen to RS Bandits re-release this for twenty twenty about almond milk. That's yeah. <laughs> Yeah, clearly we're not we're not the demographic for this song because we're not <laughs> we're, not, we're not, not milk drinkers. Yeah, okay. we don't like to fondle cows. No, we don't. Leave the cows alone. alone. But, but, but yeah, no, it is it is one of the only tracks on this album which is just just about nothing. It's that very relatable, just like this is about nothing, but is very catchy and has and and has good riffs and a nice chorus, nice chorus and all that. It's just it's just easy listening, but not but not easy listening because actually, you know, it's smooth jazz in the arches. Yeah, yeah. I would write an Edinburgh show about nothing but smooth jazz and the, and the archers. That's that's my new niche, Andrew. 
<laughs> it's, it's kind of the exact opposite of what this podcast is about, isn't it, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like uh, you've got one show, but you've got the you've got smooth jazz and the arches, and then you've got this, which is like star punk and workaholics or something. Yeah. <laughs> Any additional thoughts on this one? Um, milk. Milk. <laughs> Reminds really me of the old Yeah, you don't really see any milk adverts these days. Now, Cravendale trying to call it in the market and then no one else did it, but it's just milk's, milk's going out of fashion? That's not really a sentence I should ever have to use. I uh, can't even, I mean, uh, yeah. Do well, your mum, do your so, mum and dad still have a milk, man? No, but they did for quite a while. And yeah. I, know, I know people who live in the countryside still have milkmen. Yeah. It seems like that's a dying art. Milkman. Milk person. A milk person. And I don't milk women. Everyone was a milk man and there's no milk women. Oh, I had there. a milk. Uh, we had a milk woman. Oh, did you? Yeah. Well. She used, to let, she used to let me ride on the back of the cart down the street when I was like 10 years old. That's nice. It was the most exciting t- point of my week. I was just like, ah, I'm going at like 12 miles an hour. <laughs> she did bring you back, right? Yeah, she brought me back. No, no, I was, um, I was raised... I, w- I, w- I was raised in a um, in a dairy farm. Like, uh, it was like it was like uh, Harry Potter and the boy under the stairs, but I was the boy under the others, and then that's that's just how I yeah. nourish, just how I nourish myself. That's a terrible mime. Is that is that why you became vegan? Because yeah, yeah, just like, sucked off too many cows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, I hate that. It's such such a, such an everyday problem, isn't it? <laughs> You know. <laughs> that's what that's actually what all my early stand-up was about like, you can expect that in the next dodder of drafts so like oh guys what's the deal right when you're growing up and you just want and you just want some cereal but you've got to wank off a cow before you do it guys you know what i'm talking about wank off cows for your brekkie yeah <laughs> that's why we call it a milkshake oh <laughs> boom I, I, would, I would pay money to see Seinfeld write a bit about cows. <laughs> <laughs> mm. um, it's not one that we said we were going to talk about, but I do have a quick note, uh, which is for a track in between this and the one that we would rather do, which is track six, maybe, which is a... <clears throat> it's very RS Bandits. It's a anti-racism slow jam. Right. Like, it's just like maybe it was like the lyrics, these aren't the lyrics, but they may as well be. It's like maybe because they say the name of the song. If we weren't so racist, everything would be a bit nicer. Yeah, that's, that's something I can get on board with. Trumpets, trumpets. Yeah, racism's bad. With a bit of saxophone, it's like it's like really chilled slow jam. But the mm-hmm. thing that I've kind of written about it, because this is a fact, this is slap band in the middle of the album. This is track six. We've already had two or three tracks which are very much just like uh, women, right? Yeah. And it just it feels a bit out of place doing this like heartfelt, slow, again slow track about you know tolerance. Yeah. But then like like waiters being just like. You know, well, when you earlier said something like "you're a slut" and that's why I like you. Well, it's very jarring to go from a song about milk to then an anti-racism song. Yeah, and it's also it's so like this, the the song itself is like so on the nose, but it's almost like it's nothing like the anti-racism stuff they did later in their career. It's like, it, li- like lyrically speaking, and Arts Bandits have always been a good band lyrically, but lyrically speaking, this one is basically the Live Aid song. Yeah. yeah. It's like, oh no, it's bad, isn't it? Good thing we're not racist. Ah, mm-hmm. If only everyone was more like us. You can't be racist in a white star. <laughs> <laughs> Although that is not what I've seen on a lot of Twitter. There was a lot of. Um, like star bands, like I think Mustard Plug and Fishbone specifically were doing like a lot of Black Lives Matter um, tweets, and you were just getting like all the like the All Lives Matter knobheads like underneath it. And I think it was Mike uh, Mike Carter who we both know who kind of like did the tweet, which is like I can't think of anything whiter than like denying that racism happens, but also listening to Star. 
Yeah. Yeah. Do you, I know you've been watching How I Met Your Mother quite a lot. Mm. Uh, do you ever notice that, I don't know if it's in all the episodes, but in at least one episode, he has a mustard plug poster and Ted has a mustard Yes, plug. Yeah, yeah, I've noticed. It's, but he love must, I love mustard plug. They, they're one of the star bands that I think should have been a lot bigger than they were. Yeah, no, I never but, listened to them, to be honest. They're just catchy and dumb. As I mean, they had, again, they have the same issues that we're talking about with Irish Bandits in this album. And like, honestly, any star band you can think of, they've got those songs. Yeah. But they're just good, just catchy, wholehearted star punk and going over 20 years later, which you could argue is too long, but they're still cranking them out. <laughs> yeah, very true. They just never had that big single, like, I suppose, like, Real Big Fish did. And... No, just beer, take on me, and sell out were basically one after the other, and that's just hit after hit after hit. Yeah, very true. In the summer of Scar. Yes. So we are going to have to we are going to have to get into this, um, and I'm very upset about this because we're going to talk about track eleven. I don't care. It directly follows Band Aid, which is a phenomenal track, and it goes into uh, I don't know the question mark exclamation mark question mark. I don't even know what you're going to call this one. Yeah. Just I don't know, like in terror band. Like just what yeah. the punctuation is with the inflection. So, I, so yeah. So it goes band aid. I don't care. In terror bank. <laughs> 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 yeah. But band aid slaps. But that's not what we're here to talk about. Andrew, would you like to highlight your issues with track eleven? I don't care. Well, it's about going to watch a girls' soccer team. It's <laughs> already. Um, Do they? Do they at any point say how old the girls soccer team is? No. I, 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 let's, let's, I mean, this is, this is already kind of a shit song lyrically. Let's, let's not speculate that it's even worse. It's already shit. Let's not wait. It's already sexist and horrible. Let's not call them nonce as well. Yeah, it, basically. Completely. So a sample lyric is, go to watch those soccer games just to prove that I'm not gay. So it's, um, you've got, you know, it's, it's, it's a touch homophobic. It's well. a lot of homophobic, isn't it? Just to chuck some more. I mean, I'm, but, I'm, a, I'm a bit gay. I like football. I mean, so, recently, yeah. admittedly, to spend more time with you. But, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. However, at one point in the song, one of them says, let's all do the Macarena. So that's fun. <laughs> <laughs> You know, <laughs> it's sexist, it's homophobic, it's not cool, but hey, we all remember the Macarena, right? <laughs> yeah. So that, that's, that's nice. I think my key issue with it, and this is like aside from all the homophobia and the sexism and the go into girls, soccer girl teams to prove you're not in, I don't, right, so I have a question about this. What part of it is to prove he's straight? Is it the fact that he's watching girls play football, or is it the fact that he's watching football? Uh, I mean, I suppose it's a combination of both. Because I don't, because I mean, if it's just because you're watching girls, there's sexier sports out there. Like, uh, RS, Bandit, RS Bandits are an LA band. Watch fucking beach volleyball, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Although I guess I watch the beach volleyball to prove I'm not gay doesn't even rhyme or flow. <laughs> maybe that's why. Maybe maybe they were just like we need a sport which is two syllables. <laughs> yeah. Now my biggest issue with this is the entire through line of the song is I don't care. I don't care. You don't like me. You might think I'm gay, but I don't care. And that's why I call the song I don't care. When quite clearly you fucking do care. You've chosen yeah. to write a pretty hefty song on it. And yeah, not again, musically not the worst one, not the best by far. This yeah. is this is one of the weakest lyrically, easily, and musically it's just it's, yeah. it's generic. I think that's what's worse. I've all I've, I've always said this to you. It's like I one of my biggest issues is not necessarily when something's bad because when it's bad you've got something to talk about, but when something's like just middle of the road, and you can't really comment either way. Boring. Yeah, exactly. 
It's like a fucking cold place, I guess, isn't it? Yeah, you just like there's nothing really wrong with it, but I'm just a bit done with it, really. And also, I don't care has like a one minute like fucking spoof riff track in the studio with each other, which then goes yeah. into six more minutes of riffing in in Terabang. Yeah, and I don't know because we we can only listen to this via like YouTube, Spotify, and all that because we don't have the physical album. I don't know if it was if that final track is meant to be a bonus track that was hidden in it or something, but. That's not how you close an album. That's not a, that's not a closing track. Not if it's listed. How about as a bonus track? Fine, but six minutes of just dicking about and doing stupid voices in the studio is not a final track. No, no, it's not. I'm really against kind of like jokey kind of tracks for the sake of having them. Unless it's very, very funny, I don't think you should have them because it's just kind of cringe worthy. Like we've talked, we've talked about this in the past. I mean, especially whenever we reference Blink One Eight Two, there's a place for them. There's always a place for them. But if you're gonna do, if you're gonna do kind of like a spoof riff track, I'd yeah. rather it be an actual song. Like it can only be thirty seconds or forty. But like, um, Patty Holiday's "You Bastard Fuck a Dog," for example. Yeah. Like are great examples of that because there's still songs in their own rights. Whereas when it's just dicking about in the studio, it's not as fun. Yeah. Unless you build like a framework or structure around it. Like um in Just Friends, Nothing But Love from last year or the year before, I can't remember. Like yeah. with the radio DJ tracks and the top and the middle and I think the end of it. That works because it's within that theme and they're calling back on each other. But if yeah. that was just one track if that was just one track in the middle of the album for no reason, I'd be very in I wouldn't be into it. No. And, and it wouldn't be one of my favourite albums of the year. <laughs> it's a weird one with this. Have you got any additional thoughts? Or... Um, well, if we go back to the lyrics, lyrically they talk about going to the football game and then someone wanting to talk to them about the tactics involved with the football game. What, like a so, 4-4-2 situation or something? Yeah. So it's kind of like, if you imagine a, a girls' soccer game, Unless it's a professional game. I imagine most of the people there are parents, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So who the hell is going to a fucking girls' soccer game to analyse the tactics? Parents. Just the... They, but they go to support the kids. They don't give a shit. No, about. come on. Did you, did you play sport as a kid at all? Yeah, play football. Parent, we, did you not have, like, weirdly competitive parents? Yes, but they were more, they, they were weirdly competitive, but they weren't tactically astute. Mine, mine were well, not my parents, but other kids' parents. But it, well, it wasn't football; this was for swimming. But yeah. like, like really, like really, just like you need to do this and you do this, and it's like, like there was one parent who was like analyzing the weaknesses of like the eight-year-old who was particularly good at like butterfly throw, and we just like, right, this is weakness; you don't get him at this point. And we're just like, he's fucking eight, and your kid's twelve, like. <laughs> just let them make friends and play sport. So no, I do I do think that's a thing. But I also think that kind of like if you go into a girls' soccer game to like we said, prove you're not gay mm -hmm. and you're then there uh, talking about the tactics, you're just doing a weird power move, aren't you? Yeah. I imagine Marcello Bielsa would go to a girls football team and match and analyze the tactics. Oh <laughs> uh, Bielsa ball. Just cool. there on his little stool, squatting <laughs> <laughs> down, shouting in whatever yeah. language he speaks, Argentinian. Argentinian, yeah. Yeah, so he comes from Argentina. They, yeah, okay, but yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> I, tell, I was trying to remember the chant as I went. I was just like, <laughs> <laughs> Have you got anything? I'm trying to I still want to know. I still want to know if the girls' soccer team are their age or not. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. real. It's really been bothering me, and it's not. I think some of this is like listening back like 23 years later. In 2020, if you say the phrase girl soccer team, mm. you're not thinking teenagers. Look, I don't think it is that because quite frankly, if our ex bandits were one of the bands that are like that, because you know, we both know there's loads of them, mm. one of us would know. 
Yeah. Like, yeah. The, like one of us would have heard from someone on a scene that just like, oh yeah, Orange Bandits, nonsense. They they yeah. gave they gave it away with I don't care. That that's about that's about a Pee Wee League. It's yeah. like you know we know, but it's still you can't. It doesn't leave your head, and it's a bit creepy. Yeah, and it's also just creepy, like just going to perv up. I guess. I mean, this is America; they have cheerleaders. Like you can just go to football and prove but you're not gay. This is, this is this is interesting you say that. This was my other point. Number one, it's such a shame that you feel that you have to prove you're not gay. Yeah. Okay. Number two, if you do feel like you have to prove you're not gay, there's a lot better ways to do that than turning up at a girl's soccer match you know <laughs> yeah and I, I speak from experience with this um when i was in year nine i tried to attempt to prove to everybody that i wasn't gay by uh joining the after school dance club because <laughs> because dance was athletic and if you went to the after school dance club, you got to, what I said was you get to hang out with all the girls and you're all stretching and it's great. Blah, 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 blah. I just really like dance. I just really like dancing. <laughs> but um, fucking Rochdale Billy Elliot over here. But yeah, I do that. As, so, as someone who's done incredibly feminine things in an attempt to prove that they're not gay, it just, it, this does not work. This, even I wouldn't consider, yeah, no, I'm going to get super into women's football. Oh. <laughs> Which is just as good. I mean, you know, like the female Inwood squad is way better than the male Inwood squad in terms of actual success. But, but yeah, just bloody take a copy of FA Gem to school with you. <laughs> yeah. Just roll up a mat, just roll up a hustler, and just have like have the yeah. just have, just have the title just sticking out your bag. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh no. Okay. Yeah. Have your phone out, <laughs> and then. Before you get to school, put Pornhub on your phone and then pretend that you accidentally get people to see it. Change your mum's phone number, name on your phone, to like just a random woman's phone, random female name. And whenever she texts you to tell you that she loves you, you shove it off and just go, yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. I'm not gay. Look at this. A woman loves me and I like girls football. Yeah, make make, make up make up a story about kissing a girl at camp or something. <laughs> There's so many easier ways to. <laughs> this is almost like we're speaking from experience of just two lads who had to try and prove they were. I never saw you as like coming across as a camp child. To be honest, I definitely did. I was I was a fabulous uh, child. I guess I guess I wasn't very really camp. <laughs> just like drawing the Sim- just like drawing the Simpsons and talking about football. Yeah. Although I I did find I did think that some girls' toys were a lot better than some boys' toys. Oh, absolutely. Some girls' toys are well better. Also, girls' deodorant is way better. Stand by this. Yeah. Do you remember those do you remember doll these dolls called cupcakes? Don't think I do. It's like she's got a big skirt, and then you turn the skirt inside out, and you put the top thing on it. It's like a cake. I do remember those. Oh, they were sick. <laughs> yeah, they were cool. I used to hate Action Man as well. I always wanted, but I always wanted Barbies because you can customize them and dress them up more. I just mm-hmm. never, I just never got into war play as a child. I was always just like, I want to do like, I wanted them to like meet and socially interact and do that. It's just like, oh, hello, Action Man. Would you like some tea? Oh yes, thank you. And then you sit down, have a brew. That's I didn't want any of this kind of like he zip lines and kids doctor X in the dick. That's what it was boring. Yeah. There's only so many times you can have an action figure kicking over action figure in the dick before it gets boring. That time is hundred and fifty, but it it, <laughs> it 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 exists. I remember the original Power Rangers figures. They were cool. They they were like action man size. Yeah, I do remember those. I never, I never had one. But oh, do you remember? Do you remember those wrestling action? We've gone way off topic. Do you remember those wrestling action figures that had magnets in the fists? So yeah. you kind of like did that, and they joined up, and then you could like suplex them and stuff. Yeah, I had yeah. loads of those. I don't know where they are. They're probably worth a, probably worth a mint now, but I don't know where yeah. they are. That'd be cool. Anyway, toys aside, um, overall thoughts on 1997's those damn bandits. Um, for me, 
um, this, I wanted to love this album because I'd never given it, I'd never given it the proper time of day because halfway in progress. And to be honest, anything since, anything since this album that RS Band has done, I love. I was listening to, like, I was listening to um, both Progress and Mandala like a couple of days ago. I wanted this to be good because I wanted to believe that they'd always have that consistent hit rate because yeah. you want to fit that, but it's not possible. And unfortunately, this album does prove that to me. I still like it. There's still a load in here that I like. Like, I like that you can hear Aris Bandits as we're going to come to know them. And I like yeah. a lot of the horn lines. I like that you can hear everybody that they influenced. And the, like, yeah. even like 15 years before I got into these bands, like, I can listen to this and go, that sounds like Countdown or that sounds like Article 7. But yeah. some of the lyrics are just dog shit. It's terrible, and yeah. it's so, so interesting. So, like I said, it's too consistencies. It's either what feels like our expanders as we know and love them and what feels like a generic star band just trying to smash out a 12 tracks. Yeah. Like, I feel like this would have been a, I think this would have been a fucking great EP. Yeah. If you just really honed it down and released it as like a, even like a 6 or 7 tracker. But 12 tracks where the final one is just six minutes of them dicking about in the studio with barely any guitar. Yeah. And what, it loses there's, points. <laughs> there's one track where they literally gargle. I don't know if you remember. Yeah, I do. It's, uh, but, I mean, that was more common back then anyway. I mean, like Descendants were doing shit like that. Yeah, I, hate, I just hate that sound. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, as much as I love Descendants, whenever, whenever they start doing stuff where they clearly just like make been sampling their own farts in the studio i'm, I'm always yeah. like this is a bit much yeah i mean if, if they'd never done that blink 182 would never have done that either though so. no but, exactly and that's and that's the thing and there's like if we didn't have this album there's a lot that we wouldn't have got and if we everything leads to something and i as i said earlier i do believe that rs bandits have a lot to do with the shape of the british star scene yeah Definitely. But um, in terms of rating it, did we say the problematic lyrics lose you three points? Yeah, I think we did last time, yeah. I was going to give it... I was going to give it a seven and a half. So, unfortunately, all the problematic lyrics means I'm giving it 4.5. Which is annoying because I'm pretty sure that's the same store that we had to, that we gave like either Phoenix or... either Phoenix or... Um, yeah. Cousin Oliver, and it's much better than those albums. It's much better. That's true. But you just, I just can't, I just can't get past how dated some of the songwriting is. So you're saying four point five check pairs of checkerboard vans? <laughs> yes, I am. Okay. Um, I'd probably tempt. I I preferred that Phoenix TX album, so I'd probably be tempted to go a little bit lower on this. That's better. Um, Again, like you say, I'd probably go for a six, but then if we're taking off three, yeah, take off fair. three, I'd give it a three. So an aggregated, so an aggregated score of seven point five out of twenty. Yeah. Which it's right. It's important to know, and I said this at the top of the show, and I'll say it now. This is still one of the one of the better albums of this era of drive through, like easily. Yeah. Like we've got, we don't have to. Troll through some fucking shit before we get to the gold. Although I think we got you found Glory's first album coming up soon. Yeah, in, in a little while. The next one, well, we, we need to talk about this actually because it's it's a seven inch, so there's only two songs on it. That's fine, I'll do it. But we can still do that. It'll just be a short episode. <laughs> um, and that is "You Can Do That on Vinyl" by Alistair. Oh um, shit! Okay, yeah, that'll be fun. <laughs> <that's> <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, so that is RS Bandits, a depressingly low store from me for one of my all-time favourite bands. I'm sure you'll be able to get the chance to... Uh... Oh yeah, no, as soon as we get to halfway, I'm going to be thrilled. <laughs> exactly. But yeah, no, but this was, this was my university band. I always say this about a lot of bands where... It's like everybody liked the music they liked when they first went to university, but at university they discovered bands that expanded upon that kind of like base thing just so like everybody like went when they up until the age of 18 but when they went to uni they got into diy scenes or they got into more 
underground stuff. And for that, Iris Bandits were that star for me. I really had real big fish. I really worked with Jade. I went to uni and one of my best friends introduced me to Iris Bandits and like kept down and um, mm. a lot of like really small ones, which I miss, like Stand Out Riot and stuff like that. So yeah. I, I love Rx, but I, I'm not listening. I won't listen to this album again. There's nothing. There's nothing on this for me to come back to. No, you, oh. like I say, you'll definitely get the chance to prove your love for Alex Bandit. Oh yeah, no, no. progress. Unless I come across any lyrics I hadn't noticed before, progress will get a ten from me. I can tell you that in advance. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so that was an order at Drive Through Records by No Money in the Bank. Um, we do this we also have a show on tuesdays called dodd rough drafts which is where we go through our notes and we try and make good jokes out of bad jokes we had written um the most recent episode has a guest of our good friend john holton so definitely check that out as well as that we also have social distance warriors which is a online talk show where we just talk to musicians and comedians and artists and we make them do dumb shit and we get them to say fun things um, until then, I have been Tom B, and this has been Andrew Marsh. <laughs> this has been an order drive for records. Cheers for listening and/or watching. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye.